Animals will spend their time on different behaviours according to the conditions that they are in. In this case, these Buick swans and various diving ducks are foraging at different depths in the water column. We can exploit our knowledge of these different behaviour patterns and the range and variety of behaviours that species perform to better understand how to care for them and improve their welfare when we house them in captivity. Hello everyone, my name is Dr Paul Rose and in this presentation I'm going to be explaining about the recording and measurement of behavioural diversity and we're going to look at the use of behavioural diversity indices as a way of understanding how behavioural diversity can change according to different conditions that an animal is in. Behavioural diversity is something that tells us about the range of behaviours an individual will perform, as well as the time spent on each behaviour. And this might be important for us when we are measuring behaviour under different conditions that we find animals in. For example, if we provide them with environmental enrichment or changes to management or husbandry that might promote different types of behaviour and therefore improve animal welfare. In the case of this example of foraging waterfowl, you can see different feeding behaviours of swans and diving ducks. Maybe under different feeding conditions, these birds are able to perform a wider range of behaviours. This increases their activity, it increases opportunities for physical exercise, and therefore the bird's welfare benefits. So behavioural diversity so long as it's applied appropriately, can be a useful way of inferring positive welfare outputs for managed populations. So some reasons why you might want to measure behavioural diversity in your animals. You might be looking for a quick and easy way to interpret animal welfare based on positive behaviours, based on positive activity patterns. For example, an increase in the time spent on positive behaviours, i.e. ecologically relevant behaviours, can be indications of good welfare. Species that spend more time feeding, foraging, exploring in a captive environment as they would in the wild. Behavioural diversity can allow us to understand better our captive wild comparisons. If we have examples of lethargy, boredom or general inactivity in captive species, which we know would naturally be more active, more exploratory at particular times of the day in the wild, a BDI might be able to help interpret any form of wild captive comparison. BDI can also help us understand evolution of animal husbandry techniques to include things like environmental enrichment. So evaluating enrichment allows us to see why we are evolving husbandry to make it more appropriate for the species that we keep and therefore we can improve the animal welfare states of the individuals that experience that husbandry. So allowing us to evaluate the impacts of things like environmental enrichment is really important because if we want enrichment to be effective, it's got to promote the performance of these ecologically relevant behaviours in the same manner that free living or wild individuals would be performing those behaviours under natural conditions. You don't always need an index to calculate behavioural diversity. You can do it quite simply based on the ethogram of the species that you are investigating. Hopefully, as we are all behavioural scientists, we know that an ethogram is simply the complete list of behaviours that a species will perform. There's a description and a definition that allows us to interpret and identify the behaviours that we see. So perhaps you're going around different animal collections and you'd like to know which individuals in which of these animal collections is displaying the widest diversity of behaviour. Find your ethogram for that species and compare back to what we see in the zoo. 
identify how many ecologically relevant behaviours are meant to be performed by counting the number of behaviours that you see performed by the animals in the zoo that you are observing. And then you simply work out the proportion of observed behaviours compared to the original ethogram. If you were recording the behaviour of cranes, for example, and you have an ethogram of what a particular species of crane would do in the wild, and you go around different zoos and you count the number of behaviours you see captive individuals of that crane species performing, you would be able to say that if the wild crane had an ethogram that included 27 different behaviours, and in one of your zoos, an individual bird performed 18 behaviours, 18 divided by 27 gives you 67% behavioural diversity for that individual of that species in that zoo. There's no index here. It's simply the proportion of the overall ethogram that you have seen performed in those captive settings. If you'd like to extend that simple proportion, there are many indices out there that you can use. And the indices that we use for behavioural diversity calculations are taken from the field of ecology or environmental science. And they're indices that are used to calculate species richness, species diversity within a habitat or location. What has happened is that behavioural scientists have modified these indices to replace the total number of species with the total time spent on behaviour. So the modification has been to have the total observation time and then the time that each behaviour observed makes of that total observation time compared to individually when the total population of all species is based on the total number of each species that makes up the overall population. So this is where we can use time spent on each behaviour as our variety of activity that we see. So long as we use ecologically relevant or positive behavioural diversity, we can interpret what these differences mean for our captive animals and therefore their welfare. There's some excellent papers out there that will tell you more about using these ecological indices for behavioural diversity. And it should be noted that you should try and do this with caution. Apply the appropriate index, ensure you are being consistent and ensure you are only using information on ecologically relevant behaviours. You might see increased behavioural diversity in the zoo compared to the wild if you included stereotypic behaviours, self-directed behaviours, redirected behaviours and abnormal behaviours. But these are not ecologically relevant. We would not include them in a behavioural diversity index because that increase in diversity takes into account these abnormal or unnatural behaviours that we don't want to promote. So I recommend reading of these two papers one in the journal Animal Welfare and one in the journal Animals before you start any measure of behavioural diversity using a BDI. So you ensure your BDI is calculated from appropriate data that are meaningful to the animals and the situation that they are in. So whilst there are a range of different indices out there that you can use, this is the one that I find the easiest to apply and the one that will give you useful information if you input time spent on each behaviour for each individual that you observe. And this is the Simpsons Index or the 1 minus Simpsons Index. And I'll come to why it's a 1 minus Simpsons Index in a moment. The formula looks terrifying. But please don't worry, it's relatively straightforward. What we have in this formula is a change to the original use of the formula, which would be counts of individual species that make up an overall population, 
to time spent on individual behaviours out of an overall observation time. So large N is the cumulative amount of time that all behaviours were recorded for. So that's our overall observation time that we watched an individual and within that overall observation time, our little n i is the overall time on each behaviour that makes up the overall observation. So n i could be foraging, n i i could be exploration, n i i i could be resting, n i v could be locomotion, so on and so forth. We have a different number of n i's, but when we add them all up together, we get big n which has our total observation time. And what you can see here in the formula is we simply sum our ni's and we divide them by our total observation time with a few tweaks along the way. I'll explain these tweaks when I go through the formula in an Excel spreadsheet in a moment. So let's have a look at a data sheet that could be used for collecting data for behavioural diversity indices. This has simply been set up in Excel and provides you with information on the time spent on each behaviour, that's little m, as well as the time spent on all behaviours together, that's big n. So if we imagine that we have looked at an animal for 10 minutes, our big n would be 10. And if we imagine our observations of seven behaviours that occurred within those 10 minutes were zero spent on one behaviour, seven minutes spent on another behaviour, 0.5 of a minute spent on the third behaviour, two and a half minutes spent on the fourth behaviour, and then no time on the fifth, sixth and seventh behaviours, we've got a cumulative of seven, plus 2.5 plus 0.5, which equates to the total observation time overall. So to fill in our formula, we do ni minus one for each behavior. And then likewise, for each of these behaviors on each row, we then do ni minus one multiplied by ni. So we are doing zero minus minus one, times zero, we are doing seven minus one times seven, so on and so forth. And then we sum this column, column D, we sum that together. So 42 plus minus 0.25 plus 3.75 equals our sum of little n for each behavior. We then have the bottom row of our formula. So we have our total time minus one. So 10 minus one is nine. We then multiply ni, we then multiply n minus one by big N. So that gives us 90. And therefore our Simpsons index is 0.5. However, because we would like a one minus Simpsons index to show that a large index means more behavioral diversity and a smaller index means lower behavioral diversity, we do one minus the Simpsons index and that gives us our overall behavioral diversity index for these data. So these are fictitious data. It is simply to show you the process of going through the formula step by step to create your de behavioral diversity index for each individual that you have observed. Remember, you could then graph each of these behavioral diversity indices for each individual animal under the different conditions the behaviors have been recorded. For example, baseline against different forms of environmental enrichment to see how behavioural diversity changes with different forms of enrichment. So I've done my worked example. I've explained to you how you calculate your ratio of NIs to your big N 
your overall observation time. And I've shown you how you then calculate your one minus Simpson's index. So just to recap, remember, it's called the one minus Simpson's index. So when we have one minus the calculated index, that allows us to have a large index, meaning a large behavioral diversity, and a small index, meaning a lower behavioral diversity. It just makes it easier for us to interpret what that index means. So interpreting these data could be done in some form of graph per individual animal, per condition that they are under. As in the case of my fictitious data here, I've got a baseline for four individuals and then I've provided enrichment to the same individuals and we can see a general increase in behavioural diversity with the application of environmental enrichment. You might then want to go and run some inferential analyses on the relevant behaviours that relate back to the increase in diversity. For example, increased time in exploration, increased time in foraging, increased time in locomotion. Use the BDI as your descriptive statistic and then go and run some inferential analyses on your raw behavioural data that link back to where the increase in diversity might be. So interpreting a BDI for an animal welfare measurement is generally best done when you're comparing a baseline with a change to husbandry or management. There are some excellent sources out there that will provide you with more information on methods that we can use for zoo research, specifically about observational methods that allow us to run animal behaviour experiments. I've already mentioned some published work out there that shows you the pros and cons, challenges and opportunities of behavioural diversity indices. A couple of my own works that you might find useful. In my book, The Behavioural Biology of Zoo Animals, I provide several chapters on behavioural works, experimental designs, ways of collecting behavioural data that are suitable for zoo-based questions. And with my colleague, Dr. Lisa Riley from the University of Winchester, I also have a journal article in the Journal of Zoological and Botanical Gardens that reviews 10 important methods, concepts and theories that underpin good quality behavioural research in the zoo. And within this paper, we talk about BDIs, the usefulness of behavioural diversity indices. I hope this presentation is useful to any of you attempting to measure behavioural diversity. Remember to do your reading, remember to apply your BDI to the right type of behavioural data and good luck with your behavioural experiments. Thank you very much.